Today on From His Heart, we're in Pastor Jeff Shreve's new series called Future Shock. What in the world is going on? These are timely and eye-opening messages to help us prepare for the soon second coming of Jesus. Join us for the first message as Pastor Jeff reminds us that even though God is going to be with us during difficult days, He never said it would be easy. In 1972, futurist Alvin Toffler wrote a book that was wildly popular. The title of the book was Future Shock. In the book, Toffler described an age of rapid technological and structural change. And he said, when change comes at a rapid rate, people struggle with anxiety, and they struggle with fear, and they struggle with stress, and they find themselves in a state of shock because things are changing so quickly. Future shock. It, that was in 1972 he recognized about the shock of change. Boy, I wonder what he would say today. You know, in the 70s, early 70s, that book was so popular it sold over 6 million copies. They even made a uh, movie documentary featuring Orson Welles talking about the changes in the future. Now, without question, our world today, decades and decades uh, past the 1972 release of Future Shock, our world today is experiencing such massive changes, such rapid changes, changes to technology. We have information coming at us so fast that there's no way. It's like taking a drink out of a fire hydrant. And bedrock beliefs that, that have been foundational in our world for centuries those are being challenged, and those are being changed right before our eyes. What people think about God, what th people think about the Bible, what people think about the foundation of marriage and the family, changing right before our eyes, and it can produce such a shock. But let me tell you, God is not shocked because God sees the end from the beginning. God knows everything that's going to happen, and God told us in his word what the future holds. We're starting a new series today, and I've entitled it Future Shock. What in the world is going on? And we're going to look at some of the things that are going on in this world, and we're going to look at what God says in His Word about the last days, because God wants us to know, and God wants us to be ready. If you have your Bible, please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy was the last letter Paul ever wrote before he got his head cut off under the persecution of Nero. It was written about 66, 67 A.D. Timothy was Paul's true child in the faith. Paul picked up Timothy on his second missionary journey from Lystra, and he took him with him uh, on his missionary journeys. And Timothy was the pastor in Ephesus. Paul had set him up there. Timothy was a guy who was uh, different from Paul. Paul was a guy who would charge hell with a water pistol. Timothy was a little more timid, and Paul had to tell him, hey, uh, God hasn't given you a spirit of timidity, Timothy, but of power and love and discipline. You have to remember who you are and whose you are, and he encouraged Timothy in the faith. Well, he writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3 this, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, 
lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, and avoid such men as these. Hey, what's it going to be like, future shock, what's it going to be like in the last days? In the days we're living now, but then in the future, what is that going to look like? Well, God tells us this. He knows the future. He wants us to know the future too. You know, when the Scripture says that in the last days, you know, the Bible uses that a lot, the last days, the last days, and people say, well, what constitutes the last days? The last days are a long period of time. They're really just the, the uh, gap between the first coming of the Lord and the second coming of the Lord. All those days in between are the last days. Now, when Paul wrote, he's writing in the last days. He's writing 66, 67 or so uh, A.D., and now here we are, and we're in today's time. And so it is safe to say if Paul was living in the last days in 67 A.D., we are living in the last of the last of the last days. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, Pastor Jeff, do you think that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is near? And I said, you bet I do. I think the Lord is coming soon, and I'm excited about that, aren't you? The Lord is coming soon. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe he's not coming from a, for another hundred years. But as I look around the landscape of our world, I cannot fathom this world going another hundred years. I think the Lord is coming soon. So, if you believe that premise, as I believe that premise, then it's safe to say we're living in the last of the last days. And if Paul told Timothy, hey, it's going to be hard in the last days in 66, 67 AD, just think how hard it's going to be here in 2015. Wow. And he, he goes on to say in verse 13, he says, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Hey, well, what is the future going to be like? It's going to be hard, and it's going to get worse. Well, great. Uh, what's up with that? Well, bear, just hang with me because we're going to learn today. And if you have your Bible, I would really like you to follow along in your Bible. There's one in the seat uh, back in front of you. If not, just follow along in the screens. But we're going to be covering 2 Timothy chapter 3 today. What does the Lord say about living in the last days? Three discoveries. Discovery number one, the days will become increasingly violent and dangerous. That's one of the things that he says. Evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. In the Amplified, we get a, a better feel for what that exactly means. And the Amplified Bible says this, But understand this, that in the last days will come, set in perilous times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. That's what we're facing in these last days. Now, the Lord wants us to understand the days. He wants us to understand the times. That's why he said, hey, realize this, understand this. Rick Renner, who wrote the huge devotional called Sparkling Gems from the Greek, a great devotional book. I've been going through it this year. He said this. He said, you, he, he likes to take the, the Greek and then he Im, just adds to it all the different nuances of the Greek and he, he, he makes his own Amplified Bible. And he says this for verse 1, you emphatically must know what I'm about to tell you. In the very last part of the last days, at the very end of the age, hurtful, harmful, dangerous, unpredictable, high-risk periods of time will come. And he says, you need to know this. God wants us to know. Now, why does God want us to know? As we read those verses about uh, the 19 characteristics of people in the last days, good night. Sounds horrible. I don't want to read this. I didn't come to church, Jeff, for you to tell me how bad it is and how bad it's going to get. 
Well, I'm not. I'm just telling you what God says about the last days. He said, well, is this just designed to scare me? It's not designed to scare you. It's designed to prepare you. Here's the thing that many people forget. The Christian life is not a playground. It's a battleground. It, it's, it, it, you're called into a battle. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Hey, we're at, we're at war. That's why Ephesians 6 says you better dress for the battle. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. What kind of a soldier goes to battle uh, wearing flip-flops and, and a, a noodle? Uh, you know, he's going to the beach. You're not going to the beach. You're going to the battlefield. And we need to remember that. We're in a battle. And God is saying, this is what's going to happen in these last days. So you need to get ready. Not to scare us, but to prepare us because the Lord wants us to know what's coming down the pipe. And he says it's going to be violent and it's going to be dangerous and it's going to be difficult to say the least. So be aware. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. God wants us to understand the times and God wants us, secondly, to understand man without the fear of God. One of the basic, basic, basic commands in the Bible is the fear of the Lord. We are to fear the Lord. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. We read in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the ABCs. It's like learning a language. What do you, if you're going to learn English, what do you learn? You learn the alphabet. You learn the ABCs. What are the ABCs in the spiritual realm? The fear of the Lord. It's the first button on your shirt. If you miss that button, I don't care how you do the other buttons, your shirt is off because you missed the first button. The fear of the Lord is the first button on the shirt. It's the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge, and we're living in a world today where men do not fear God. Women don't fear God. Boys and girls don't fear God. We used to live in a world where people had a, they might not have been Christians, but they had a fear of God. And a fear of God says that you recognize that God is God and you're not God. You recognize who God is and who you are. I am, in relation to God, a pimple on a flea because God is so great. The fear of the Lord, and we've lost that. And you know what we've replaced the fear of the Lord with? We've replaced the fear of the Lord with the love of self. See what it says in verse 2? Difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self. I'm not going to love God. I'm not going to fear God. I'm not going to acknowledge God. Why? Because it's all about me. It's all about me. That's the world we live in today. Now, it, it, this uh, love of self can be a little tricky because, you know, you say, well, does God not want me to love me? Is, is God saying that I should not like me, not love me, not care for me? No, that's just assumed in the Bible. It's never commanded in the Bible, love you. It's commanded to love your neighbor as yourself. It's commanded husbands to love your wives even as your own bodies. It's just assumed in the Bible that we love ourselves, that we're going to protect ourselves. Somebody is really, uh, they're really off when they're trying to hurt themselves because they hate themselves. God wants you to love what he loves. Well, he loves you, so you can love you too. The love of self, as it says in 2 Timothy 3, 2, that's totally different. It's saying that I am center stage. It's all about me. And so when I am in love with myself, I become a narcissist, and the whole world begins to revolve around me. Man, that's a scary deal. And out of that love of self comes a sewer pipe 
full of all kinds of evil and all kinds of sickening thing. It all flows from the loss of the fear of God. It says in Psalm 36, verse 1, Sin whispers to the wicked deep within their hearts. They have no fear of God at all. They have jettisoned God for self. And whereas God used to be on center stage, now self is on center stage. And listen, when the center of gravity shifts from God to man, that center of gravity is off terribly, and all sorts of filth comes out of the love of self. As it says, there'll be lovers of self. And then it says there'll be lovers of money. Well, it stands to reason if you love yourself, you want to have more money to do for yourself. So they become lovers of money. And you know, the thing is, you don't have to have money to be a lover of money. Many people are poor, but they love money because they think money is their way out. Money is going to solve all my problems. So you can have lots of money and be a lover of money. You can have uh, no money and be a lover of money. Or you can have lots of money and not be a lover of money. You can have lots of, uh, no money and not be a lover of money. But in the last days, you're going to have a predominant amount of men and women, boys and girls, who are lovers of self. It's all about me. And they're going to be lovers of money, more money to do things for me. They're going to be boastful. They're going to be arrogant. Why? Because it's all about me, and I need to tell you about me. They're going to be revilers. That word means literally blasphemers. They're disobedient to parents. They're ungrateful. They're unholy. They're unloving. You know that unloving in the New American Standard? That literally means without natural affection. They don't have a natural affection for their brothers, their sisters, their mom, their dad. We've read stories, all of us, true stories of kids who murdered their parents. Unloving, without natural affection. Parents who murder their children. They're irreconcilable. That means they're truce breakers. Malicious gossips. The word in Greek is diabolos, for where we get devil, the slanderer, the false accuser, and that people are going to be just like the devil in the last days. They're going to be without self-control, brutal, haters of good, hostile to virtue. Literally, that's what that means. Treacherous, reckless, conceited. That word conceited means swollen with self-importance. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied the power thereof. And he says, Timothy, avoid men like this. Now, Timothy had them in Ephesus. There were people like that in Ephesus. Why? Because Timothy in 67 AD was living in the last days. But we in 2015, we're living in the last of the last days. And we see more of this than he saw. Because evil men and imposters will increase, and they'll go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So that's man without God, without the fear of God. Now, if you remember the devil, his very first temptation in the Garden of Eden, what was it? You eat of the fruit, and you will be like God. You don't need God, Eve, if you eat of this fruit. And you know, God's just holding out on you, Eve, because he wants you to be dependent upon him. And he knows that if you eat this fruit, God knows that in the day you eat, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delight for the eyes and desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate it. She gave it to her husband with her and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together to hide their nakedness. And when the Lord came down in the cool of the day, he started looking for Adam and Eve and said, Adam, Adam, where are you? And Adam and Eve were hiding in the tree and Adam said I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid myself and God said who told you that you were naked Adam had always been naked but now he knows he's naked what happened when he ate the tree all of a sudden when he ate the forbidden fruit he lost his God consciousness and he gained a self consciousness and he knew that he was naked we live in a world where people want to be their own God. They've lost the fear of God. Wow. You know what the Scripture says about that? It says it is a terrifying thing 
to fall into the hands of the living God. When you read in Revelation chapter 20 of God's judgment of the wicked, all those who spurned him, all those who rejected him, they come before him at the great white throne judgment, and it is a terrifying thing. It says earth and heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. Nobody wants to be there. There ain't going to be one person at the great white throne who saunters up into the face of God and say, I don't believe in you, God, and I'm not afraid to go to hell. They're going to be wetting their pants at the, judgment, at the great white throne judgment. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so God says, hey, in this, these last days, people reject the fear of me. They choose the love of self, and that opens the floodgate, and that opens the sewer pipe of all sorts of terrible, horrible things. Second discovery. Not only will the days become increasingly violent and dangerous, the days will see a rise in false teachers and false teaching. Verse 6, he says, for among these that hold to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, men of depraved mind rejected as regards the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, as also that of those two came to be. Hey, what's going to happen in the last days? Well, things are going to get dangerous because people are loved, or they're going to be brutal and haters of good, and they love pleasure more than they love God. But then also you're going to have a rise of false teachers and false teaching. You know, it, it's interesting. Jesus talked about that in Matthew 24. And Jesus said, and many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. That word many means an abundance. It means a large, a large amount of false prophets. And we live in a world today where there is, a, there is an abundance of false teachers and false teaching. You can turn on TV and you can watch uh, program after program of false teacher, teacher, false teacher, false teacher. Now, they don't advertise themselves as, I'm a false teacher. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 7? He said, they will come to you, these false teachers, in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. And you know, Jesus talked about false teachers. Paul talked about false teachers. Peter talked a lot about false teachers. John talked about false teachers. Jude talked about false teachers. They creep into the church, Jude says, second to the last book of the Bible. Uh, they they kind of ease their way and, and slither their way into the church, kind of like a, uh, if you've watched a National Geographic where you see the, the crocodiles coming after their prey. They just kind of slip into the water without a ripple. That's how these false teachers come, and they come into the church, and they teach destructive heresies, even denying, the Bible says, the master who bought them. That's why they hold to a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They deny the power of the gospel. They deny the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they oppose the truth. And that's what he says. They're just like he, he likens them to two guys during the days of Moses, Janus and Jambres. You say, who are those guys? Well, they were the magicians of Pharaoh. That's what the Scripture says. Janus and Jambres. Now, we don't get their names in the book of Exodus, but in extra-biblical Jewish writings, we find out about these two guys, and obviously that's who they were because Paul put it in the Scripture. God by, uh, inspired Paul to write about these two guys, Janus and Jambres. And in the movie, The Ten Commandments, if you, if you watched that last week, uh, Moses calls those guys in the movie by Cecil B. DeMille. He calls his magicians Janus and Jambres. And here they are, and they oppose Moses. Well, how did they oppose Moses? See, they hold to a form of godliness. They come across like they're spiritual. But they deny the power of the gospel. You know, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. For salvation. There's power in the gospel. These guys deny the gospel. But they have power, just as the Egyptian magicians had power. You remember uh, 
Moses takes Aaron's rod. He comes before Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, forget it. I don't know who you are. I don't know the Lord. Yeah, I do not know Yahweh, neither shall I let your people go. Who is the Lord? Who is Yahweh? He said, that I should let his people go. And so Moses did a miracle. He threw down Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod turns into a snake. But Janice and Jambres, they get their magical arts going, and they, their rods become snakes. Aaron's rod eats their snakes, kind of as a tip-off. Something's different with these guys. Second plague on Egypt was turning the Nile to blood. That ought to get your attention. But Janus and Jambres could do that too. Third plague that came down the pike on Egypt. Frogs. Frogs. Man, they had frogs everywhere. Janus and Jambres could produce frogs too. Fourth plague, gnats. Janus and Jambres couldn't produce the gnats. Kind of interesting how God put the, the, uh, just the limit on it. You can do all this other stuff. You can't make gnats. They couldn't make gnats. So what they tell Pharaoh? They said, this is the finger of God because we can't do it. And so, uh, you know, you want to run with God. God's just going to leave you in the dust. So the fourth plague they couldn't do. Fifth plague, the, the plague on the cattle, they couldn't do that. Sixth plague was boils. They couldn't even come and appear before Pharaoh. You know why? Because they were covered in boils. God has such a sense of humor. Uh, you, these guys are thinking they could hang with God and hang with the miracles of God. They can't. And listen, the false teachers, they might be able to do some stuff because there's demonic power there. But they've denied the true power of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They've denied the Lord Jesus Christ. And they oppose the truth. They stand against the truth. Listen, what do we do in these days? where there's so much false teaching out there. Hey, you say, ah, how do I know who's genuine, who's true? How do I know who's a sheep and who's a wolf in sheep's clothing? Well, Christians must not be spiritually weak and undiscerning. See, it says in verse 6, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins led on by various impulses. Spiritually weak women... It's not talking about they hadn't been to the gym in a while. It's these, are, these are women who are just spiritually weak. They don't know the Word of God very well. And they're probably not under the authority of their, uh, the protective authority of their husband or the protective authority of the church. And so they're sitting ducks. They're just spiritually weak, and they have sins in their lives, and they're weighed down with sin and with guilt, and these false teachers like the crocodile comes into the water. They come without a ripple, and they go after them. You know, if you've watched the National Geographic channel, and you've ever seen the lions when they hunt, you know, the Bible says that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You watch lions when they go after a pride of, of kudu or some kind of wildebeest or something like that. What are they, who do they get? They get the, the strongest, fastest wildebeest? No, they get the one that just can't, can't quite make it. It's like, man, I got a bad hip. Hold on, gang. You know, and it's that kind of deal. And the lion gets him. He, he doesn't get those that are moving fast with the pack. He gets the weak. He gets the, the ones that can't quite make it. You know, lions aren't saying, well, I'm not going to eat that when he's weak. That, it tastes good to the lion. He doesn't care. And so here, how do you protect yourself? How, how do you keep yourself from being um, attacked and duped and deceived by the false teachers and their false teaching? You spend time in the Word of God. That's how. You build yourself up. The Word of God is milk, it's meat, it's food, it's bread. It's what helps us grow. And so you spend time in this book, and you spend time under the covering of a Bible-believing church. And you don't get out there on your own thinking, well, I can do this on my own. I was watching a National Geographic thing today on YouTube, and it was a it was a little wildebeest calf that got away from the herd, lost the herd somewhere, and it's just out there. And they said, a wildebeest calf, they'll just look to connect with other, another group. And so he's just out there just kind of looking around, and all of a sudden he sees a, a pack of lions. He's like, oh, maybe I can hang out with them. It didn't go so well, you know? They said the lions weren't even very hungry, but they thought, wow, it's, just, it's like room service. I'll kill you. You're just right here. Uh, that... that that's not good. You need the protection of the church and the weak women 
laid down with sins. They're outside of the protective covering of the church. I know some people like this. And they're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And they're duped by the false teachers and the false teaching. Now listen, you got to remember something about the devil. The devil is a deceiver, and he is good at deception. The Bible says that if possible, he'd deceive even the elect. Don't ever think, well, he could never deceive me. Baloney, he can deceive any one of us. If God weren't protecting you, you'd be in big-time trouble. Let me tell you how deceptive the devil is. When Jesus came, as we talked uh, Palm Sunday and then Easter Sunday, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he was coming to them as their Messiah, and they received him as such for a very short time until they said, well, you're not overthrowing Rome. Crucify him, crucify him. Jesus said this. He said, I come in my Father's name, and you don't receive me. Another will come in his own name, and him you will receive receive. And when the Antichrist comes, the Jews are going to say, that is our Messiah. I mean, you talk about getting it 180 degrees wrong. No, your Messiah came in on Palm Sunday, and you said crucify him on Friday. This is the devil incarnate, and he's the one that you hail as Messiah. Hey, the devil is slick. you got to know this book, and you have to be discerning. That's why it says in 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many have gone out. So test the spirits. You say, how do I test the spirits? How do I test people on television or people on the radio or or people send me something. I get some kind of uh, email and it's some kind of teaching. How do I test what this person is saying? Three C's. Three C's. This is how you test uh, any kind of teacher. Number one, character. Test that person's character. And and it's hard sometimes. You say, well, I don't know this person. How do I test their character? Check to see how that person lives. You know, I did a little check to see uh, Forbes had the top 10 pastors uh, in terms of, of net worth. Top pastor, his net worth is $150 million. I say he's doing pretty well, $150 million. You know, and they say, well, you know, God wants us to be wealthy. Well, obviously, uh, you're wealthy. I guess that's what you say. You know, I mean, it's kind of like, hey, send in your money and God will bless one of us. Uh, you know? $150 million. What did Jesus have when they crucified him? A robe and sandals and a tunic. He said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, and the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. $150 million. Check their character. You know, you've heard, isn't it, in the news so much about a pastor was saying how he, he has to go all around the world, which is a great thing, but his plane wasn't doing so well, so he needed a $65 million plane. Really? Is that the only plane that you can get, a $65 million? He said, you know, if, if just a couple hundred thousand of you would give me $300, I could buy the plane. I guess you could. I mean, you can do the math, right? Good night. What does that reveal? It reveals this person's character. You have to have the most expensive plane to do the word and the will of God. What did Paul have? Two shoes. I mean, he just, he just hoofed it where he went. So you check their character. Check the content. What are they teaching? Does it line up with the Word of God? Let me tell you what you hear lots of on television. Health, wealth, prosperity, fame, fortune, that kind of thing. You know who preaches a gospel of health, wealth, and fame? The devil. You say, well, no, I don't think that's true. Uh Uh-huh, it is true. Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. He's fasted for 40 days, and the devil comes to him, and he says... If you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread. You're looking a little puny there, Jesus. You're looking a little uh, weak. You need to eat. You need to 
increase your health. Command these stones to become bread because after all, it's all about health. And, and hey, after you do that, um, let me take you and show you all the kingdoms of this world because they've been given to me and I'll give them to you if you'll just do this one little thing. Jesus, just bow down and worship me and I will load you down with material things and I'll give all this wealth to you. And, and then, and then let me, let's go to the top of, of the temple and jump down. Jesus, because if you jump down, the scripture says he'll give his angels charge concerning you lest you dash your foot against a stone. God will, the Father, he'll send his angels so you don't get hurt and everyone will ooh and ah over you. Health, wealth, fame. Watch for the content. Is that what's coming out? What's the content supposed to be? The content is supposed to be the gospel. Paul said, I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Jesus Christ was crucified, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day. That's at the heart. If that's not at the heart of the teaching, something is seriously off because that's what we're called to do is to lift up the name of Jesus. And I, if I be lifted up, the Lord says, I will draw all men to me. So the content. And then look at the converts, the last C. Character, content, converts. What are the people like who follow this, this guy, this teaching? Do they have godliness in their life? Do, do you sense and smell the sweet aroma of the knowledge of the Lord on their lives? Listen, the days we'll see arise in false teachers and false teaching. And the Lord is saying, be ready, be aware of this. Watch out for the Janus and the Jambres. They may have some power, but it's demonic power. You make sure that that person hasn't denied the only master and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then discovery number three, the days will require Christians to be good soldiers. Paul told Timothy in chapter 2, verse 3, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier. Of Christ Jesus. Remember what we said? The Christian life is not a playground, it's a battleground. You're not coming to the Christian life like it's a day at the beach. Bring my flip-flops and my noodle and my floaties because it's all just, we're coming to church just to, just to sing kumbaya and hear about how the Lord loves us. Hey, it's wonderful, and the Lord does love us, but the Lord has put us in battle. And the Lord reminds us, your citizenship is in heaven. You're not citizens of this earth. You're strangers and aliens. And we used to sing that song, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid, are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And that's so true. And so we have the mindset, if we're going to be biblical, if we're going to be wise, if we're going to be walking with God, especially in these last days, we need to have the mindset, I'm in the Lord's army. Man, I'm a soldier in the Lord's army, and I want to be a good soldier. Let me tell you about good soldiers. Good soldiers endure hardship and persecutions. That's a mark of a good soldier. Paul says this in verse 10. But Timothy, you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me, and indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You know where Timothy was from? He was from Lystra. You know what happened to Paul on his first missionary journey? He was stoned at Lystra. And they thought he was dead, and they dragged him out of the city. And Timothy and his mom and his grandmother, they were privy to that information because that was big news. When the evangelist came to town and we stoned him, we thought we killed him, but somehow the guy got up. Kind of like that song, I get knocked down, get up again, never going to knock me down. And that's what happened to Paul. It's like, this guy's like, he's just like the Energizer bunny. He just keeps coming. He went back into the town and started preaching again. It's like, we just killed you. No, you didn't. 
He endured persecution. Timothy saw it. Timothy was from Lystra. And he says, you remember what happened to me. You remember the sufferings and the persecution. Let me tell you something. Sometimes we read in the Bible, these guys get stoned. And we just say, oh, yeah, he got stoned. How about if you get stoned? There's a lot of pain associated with getting stoned. That happened to him. Got beaten with rods. That happened to him. Got, got placed in Philippi. His feet were placed in the stocks, stretched out in the stocks in the inner prison. That happened to him. And there was suffering that takes place in the Christian life. And good soldiers endure the suffering. And listen, good soldiers know that it's going to be hard. I know many of you saw the movie American Sniper. Chris Kyle. Navy SEALs, special forces. Those guys know it's not going to be easy. They don't go into special forces thinking, well, what do you got with you? Well, I got my flip-flops. I got my noodle. It's just going to be a blast. They know it's not like that. They know it's going to be hard. And listen, we need to start getting the mindset of a soldier, of a special forces soldier that says he never said it was going to be easy. And so I need to go into it knowing, hey, in the last days, difficult, dangerous, hard times are going to be there, and I'm going to be ready for those by God's strength and by God's grace. So a good soldier, he endures hardship. Good soldiers don't quit. They don't quit. Did you know that the statistics say that 1,500 pastors quit the ministry every month? 1,500. Some of them because it's moral failure and they're out. Some of them get pushed out. Some of them just get so depressed that they throw in the towel and quit. Listen, I have been on both sides of this because I was in my 30s when God called me in the ministry. You can look at the ministry as, as a, an outsider from, from here looking to the platform, and it can seem like, you know, you hear, always hear the jokes. Well, you guys, you only work one day a week. Oh. <laughs> Listen. Now, I know working is hard because I did that. Ministry is hard, too. It's just hard in a different way. It's emotionally hard, and it's spiritually hard because you get attacked from the enemy. And there's no doubt that a lot of pastors quit because they just get so discouraged. They just don't want to do it anymore. And they get people griping and complaining about this and that and the other. Not you folks, other guys, you know. <laughs> But here is a poem. I've shared with you this poem before, but I love it. And you might be here, and you might be ready to throw in the towel on your Christian life because you just say, it's just so hard. I want to let go, but I won't let go. There are battles to fight by day and night for God in the right, and I'll never let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. I'm sick, tis true, and worried and blue and worn through and through, but I won't let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. I will never yield. What? Lie down on the field and surrender my shield? No, I'll never let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. May this be my song amid legions of wrong. Oh, God, keep me strong that I never let go. Listen, don't ever let go. Don't ever quit in your walk with God. It will get hard because it gets hard in battle. But don't quit. And let me tell you some good news before we close. Good soldiers, you know what happens to them? Good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ, they experience divine deliverance. Paul said, hey, Timothy, you know the persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And he says in chapter 4, verse 18, some of the last verses he ever wrote, the Lord will deliver me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Hey, I want to close with this story. I ran across this just today, as a matter of fact. It's the story of a German pastor named Pastor Schweitzer. Pastor Schweitzer was ministering in Latvia right after World War I. The Russians, who were upset at the Germans, they 
took Pastor Schweitzer in Latvia, and they took him to a concentration camp. They had camps like that, the gulag, the Russian gulag system, and they had camps like that for people that they deemed uh, a threat to society. And since he was a spiritual person and Russia was an atheistic country, they said, you are a threat. And so they put him in this place. The place was known as the prison without a hope on earth. The guards were very brutal and cutthroat. And Pastor Schweitzer was a pastor who said, I'm going to shine and share for Jesus no matter what. I'm going to be a good soldier for Jesus no matter what. And he was over 60 years old when they took him to this camp. And he began to shine and share. And his big thing was singing. He would sing and sing and sing and sing praises to the Lord. And the soldiers, the guards, they couldn't stand it that they couldn't break Pastor Schweitzer. And they would beat him, and they would cane him, and they would torture him, and they would do terrible things to him, and he would look at them and say, God, forgive you. God, forgive you. And he would continue to sing. And he encouraged the other prisoners because he was such a strong man of faith and he was so contagious and infectious with his joy. And he sang and sang and sang. Well, they got sick. The new commander came in. He got sick of this guy singing all the time because it made a mockery of the torture camp that they were in. And so he said, I, I, I'm going to break you. And he took Pastor Schweitzer and he put him in solitary. And he put him in there for a long time. And you could hear him singing. In the distance, he just sang and sang and sang in solitary. And finally, in January, they let him out. And the camp commander said this, you better quit singing or you're not going to like the consequences. They took him back. He went back to his barracks with the other prisoners. And he said, men, he said, I missed Christmas with you. So who wants to come and pray and sing? And they began to pray, and they began to sing, and the camp commander found out about it, and he ran into the prison barracks, and he took his pistol, and he began to pistol whip Pastor Schweitzer in his mouth, in his nose, in his eyes. And he grabbed him, and he said, I'm going to break you once and for all. And he took him outside, and the prisoner said that they could still hear Pastor Schweitzer singing and eventually the singing stopped. They went out the next day. It had been freezing cold there, way below zero. They went out the next day, and what they saw startled them. What that camp commander had done to the pastor was he began to spray him with water in the freezing cold until Pastor Schweitzer turned in to an ice statue. And the other prisoners came out and they saw Schweitzer and he was frozen in this position, making a cross with his arms. When he stopped singing on earth, it's when the Lord delivered him and took him to heaven and he began singing with the angels all the glories of God. You know, I read that story, and I just said, oh, God, help me to be a guy like that. Come what may, that I'd be a good soldier, that I'd be able to praise you and sing your praises no matter what happens, that I would know that my job on this earth is to shine and share. That's it. No matter what else happens to me, that is what I'm here for, to shine for Christ and to share my story and to share the gospel. And if I get brutalized, if I get put in some kind of camp someday and I get beaten to death, then let me get beaten to death with the joy of Jesus on my face and the song on my lips. And listen, the Lord, as Paul said, right before he got his head cut off, the Lord will deliver me from every evil deed and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory. Amen. Amen. The Bible clearly tells us what the world's going to be like when the Lord returns. And you know, that world that the Bible describes, it's upon us right now. So here's the big question. Are you ready for the return of Christ? 
I mean, if he came back right now, are you ready? So many people are not ready. They're not 100% sure, but you can get sure today. You can pray this simple prayer with me and mean it from your heart, and the Lord will come in and change your life forever. Just say with me, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you're God in the flesh. I believe that you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Jesus, I believe that you love me. So I ask you to come into my life, forgive me of all my sins, cleanse me, make me the person you want me to be. I surrender my all to you, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know what's going on in your life, to know how we can pray for you, to know that you just prayed that prayer with me to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.